we're going to get started. So, hello everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day today to tune into our webinar. We're going to be uh, taking a deeper dive into the results of our first annual contribution survey. Uh, my name is Marty Kirshner. I'm a manager in the audit department at Gregory & Gray. I have over nine years of experience and I work closely with Jim Donnell over here to help manage our employee benefit plan practice as well as perform audits, interviews, and consulting for some of our other non-public clients. Hi, I'm Jim Donlin. I'm a director at the firm. I've been with the firm for over 10 years. I spend half my year auditing companies' financial statements in a variety of industries and, and helping consult on different projects with those clients. And I spend the other half of my year auditing employee benefit plans. As a group, we audit over 80 plans each year in a, in a variety of different um, types of plans. So a lot of 401k plans, 403b plans, some 11k audits for company for public companies that have their stock in the plan. We audit some 401a plans, some and defined benefit plans. So there's really if there's a benefit plan out there, we, we generally have the expertise to audit that plan. So, you know, the purpose of this presentation is we want to just take the survey that we have sent out to the public over the last month and take a deeper look. So, you know, by doing this, the plan is to give you some more insight into some of the data that we got as well as look at some trends and, you know, best practices that we received as a result of the survey and also just from our experience auditing plans of what we see in our various clients is with our various clients as we try to help them operate a successful plan. So, you know, what brought about this survey was that we have other niches and practice groups within the firm and we have you know, a wealth of valuable information and a lot of success performing some benchmarking surveys and some other studies. So, you know, it kind of dawned on us that we have a benefit plan a benefit plan practice group with, you know, more clients than some of these other ones. So, you know, this could just be another way for us to add value to our clients. So this kind of turned out to be a no brainer. So what we did was we sent this survey out to, you know, all the plans that we had access to in the New England area through some database through and, and uh, people who subscribe to our benefit plan newsletter. So, you know, at the end of the day, we had a really high response rate for our, our first year doing this. And with the data we received, it felt it was, you know, accurate enough to distribute and it was very valuable. And as you noticed from the survey, we focused, you know, our questions specifically around plan design and we didn't want to get too deep into plan returns. But, you know, if you're someone who's looking to benchmark some data with your plan as it results to how the returns are doing, we're happy to do that offline. You know, with this presentation, we kind of want to keep it informal. So if you do have questions along the way, you know, please do not hesitate to ask them. We're happy to also take any question and answers, you know, towards the end. So again, please feel free to speak up as we go. So we wanted to give a little background into the types of plans that we're responding and, and their size and the number of participants. So. The first slide here are the average plan size. This is just a breakout of the respondents. So as you can see, there weren't many plans that with under a million in assets and kind of that the core was between one and 10 million. And there's also a lot of factors that go into this. It's not necessarily, it depends on the age of the plan, how long it's been around, what the participation rates are, the number of employees involved with the plan, what the employer matches. If there's a significant match, then obviously the plan is going to grow over time. And, Generally, when there's a nice match, there's also a lot of participation in those plans. So just to give you an idea, if, if your plan falls into one of these buckets, that, that's, that's who we've been, been responding from. In terms of the number of participants, um, most of the plans we have access to are, are large plans, which is generally over 100 participants. So it's not really a surprise that the smaller percentage was under 100 participants. Um, and then you'll see on the Extreme on the other side, we have 500 to 1,000 and over 1,000, and those are typically your plans that have over 100 million in assets just because of the, the pure volume of the participation in those plans. And with the, the, when I talk about 100 participants in a plan, that's, that's really when you need your audit. So once you're around 100, you need to start evaluating if you need an audit, and, and that's determined on the first day of the plan year. And there's what's called an 8120 rule, and if you are under 120, and you filed as a small plan the year before, you can elect to again file as a small plan and, and waive the audit requirement. However, once you have over 120 on the first of the year, you need an audit. And the tricky part here is you, can't, you have to get below 100 in order to waive the audit in a subsequent year. So it's not that you can have 121 at the beginning of this year and next year we get a couple of people out so we don't need the audit anymore. They don't allow that. And, and, and it's done intentionally so that you're not having a plan that needs an audit one year then doesn't the next because there's a lot of procedures that need to be done for the beginning and end of the year. So it wouldn't really be saving plans all that much and it's a little more consistent that way. So 
So we wanted to take the size of the plan a step further and, and break it down by industry to help you know, the people listening and also other decision makers see how they stack up within their respective industries. You know, as you can see, the largest group of respondents that fell into the professional services group was made up of a bunch of different law groups such as you know, law firms, wealth management, um, we had some bankers, some staffing companies and engineering. You know, so I would say given the breadth of companies that fall into that professional service umbrella, I, it's not really surprising at all that that was you know, the biggest group. You know, after that, manufacturing was the second largest at, at 11 percent. And you know, on the results that were distributed, there was another column which we uh, had as other. And we wanted to be able to elaborate on what made up that other in case people were curious if their industry fell into that bucket. You know, so several respondents in this group were you know, food distributors. Uh, we had some environmental companies. Uh, a few transportation companies, and what I found to be pretty interesting was multiple sports broadcasting networks, which I was surprised to see companies in, a, in an area that specific, but it was, it was pretty cool to have companies like that respond. Um, what we're seeing here, though, is that we have a very diverse group of respondents, which I believe is helpful in, in seeing patterns across the industries and not just weighted towards one or two. Um, and as you'll see on the next slide, we try to break it down even further within these industries. So we, f we found a lot of value in putting this slide together. You know, here, here we're breaking down the average contribution per employee, the average contribution per employer, and the average employer contribution as a percentage of the employee contribution. So hopefully this information is providing people with some in insight in their respective industries to look at you know, their own plan and see how they stack up in, in their industry. You know, with regards to employee contributions, it, it wasn't really surprising to see professional services, software, and technology at the top of the list for you know average contribution per participant. If you just look at the cross-section or demographic of the workforce for these industries, you're going to see more highly compensated individuals. You're going to see higher participation in the plan than you would say a manufacturing company. Um, you know, when looking at our own client base, we tend to see lower participation rates in both manufacturing and education, more specifically on the daycare side, where the average salary is much lower compared to the other industries, and employees have a stronger need for an immediate cash flux or just don't have the education to see the value you know, in saving for retirement. So it brings down the average contribution a little bit. You know, what I also found interesting from this was that the nonprofit and education sector, you know, which most likely made up our big bulk of 403B plans, had the highest percentage match as a percentage of employee contributions. You know, I can speak from experience. I, I got a bunch of 403Bs that I work on, and they, I believe that they have a very generous matching policy, which can be enticing. You know, and it adds value to the staff that works at these organizations because you know, they're working in the private sector, so they don't necessarily receive the benefit of being in a pension. So it's important that they do have a strong retirement benefit. So when I saw this percentage come back, I actually kind of expected it. The professional service group came in at a, at a 44% as an average. And you know, what, I mean, just to dumb it down, what it means is for every dollar contributed, the employer is contributing 44 cents. So if you're tuning in and you fall into that professional services group and you want to drill down to your specific industry, you can, you can let us know and we'll, we'll provide that information to you offline after the presentation. But um, if there's any questions on this slide, we're happy to take them now or we can wait till the end. But we found this to be one of the more revealing slides that we put together. And, and Marty brought up a good point about educating the employees about the, about the importance of retirement planning. Sometimes it's something that you, you have people starting fresh out of college and they're not really aware of what they want to do and they don't like seeing $100 come out of their paycheck each week. But I think if it's a nice benefit to your employees if, if you can set aside some time and a lot of TBAs will, will do that on the house. Um, it's something they would like to do and get some face time with the employees and it's really a win-win for everyone. One of the trends we've been seeing in a lot of our plans lately is, is auto enrollment. We've been seeing that go up and up and up over the years. I, I would say in the plans we audit, it's, it's probably almost half that we see. In terms of the respondents, 39% of the plans indicated that they have auto enrollment. And the general starting percentage you see in that window is 3 to 5% is really where you see it. And the nice thing, there's a few nice things about auto enrollment. One, it really increases participation. I mean, I think a lot of people naturally don't like dealing with paperwork and that type thing. So if you have something that's just automatically going to happen, more often than not, an employee will end up joining when maybe they wouldn't have joined if, you had, if they had to go out of their way to do it themselves. And it's, like we were just talking about earlier with education, it's really nice for, for new hires out of school where they can, they can be taught about how the plan works and then they don't have to deal with the paperwork and it just automatically happens for them. And generally, if participation's up, 
you see discrimination testing result failures go down, and that's that's beneficial for the highly compensated employees involved with the plan. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add to that too is the number that had auto enrollment was 39 percent, and that was probably up from last year. And I, my prediction is that this number is going to continue to go up as our, I think auto enrollment is becoming a much more prevalent feature in plan design because plans are becoming more educated and learning that you know they want to pass discrimination, they want their employees to receive the benefit of a match, and again, as I mentioned earlier, they want their employees to be set up for some semblance of uh, a retirement fund when it's time to stop working. So I believe this trend will continue to go upwards. And when we do the survey next year, uh, my guess is that percentage will be much higher than 39%. So some more into the, the pros and cons of auto enrollment. So like we said, it's, it's automatically going to increase participation. And then with that, your likelihood of passing annual discrimination tests is also going to increase. But it's, there are benefits to it, but you also have to weigh out the, the cons. There's really, it requires a strong internal control system to implement auto-enrollment. We've seen it with some clients over the years where they, they try to implement this and the systems aren't ready to do that yet, and you just end up with a lot of administrative issues to deal with. You have people going in too early, people going in too late, and then that burden falls on the company to take care of that, whether it's with company time or company money to make, it, to make people whole. So, I would, I would strongly recommend that before you do this, you, you jump into, you weigh out the pros and the cons and see if your system can handle it because if you're, you're doing this as a benefit to the employees but you also have a business to run, you don't want to be wasting people's time and, and costing the company more money to deal with this. Yeah, I would say too, one of the biggest hiccups when we're performing our audits revolves around the issues of auto enrollment and making sure that all employees are being enrolled timely because as Jim mentioned, you need a strong internal control system and it's a very cumbersome process because there has to be someone who's tracking, you know, every time an employee is hired that they're getting into the plan timely. And you know, there's a few tests that we're able to do to figure out if they're done timely. But you know, I would say more often than not, there's always one, two, three people that are falling through the cracks. And you know, it creates more work for the plan administrator. It creates more work for us. And uh, it's important that you have a strong system in place to make sure that the, ben the employees are receiving the benefit of getting enrolled timely. Otherwise, you know, as a plan administrator or the company, you're going to be on the hook to fund those lost deferrals and earnings to them. <coughs> And the, the last thing I'll add on, on auto enrollment is we, we recommend having employees sign waivers if, if they truly do not want to be in the plan. Now there's a lot of easy ways to do it. Some, some we see you have to log into the, the plan sponsor website and elect 0%, so in a sense you already have your waiver. But if your plan isn't working that way, we strongly recommend it. We've, we've seen instances where somebody comes forward a year or two down the line and they claim that they never waived participation, they don't know why they weren't in the plan, and then it's it's a headache and, and it's not a good look. So as we've been, we've been talking a lot about non-discrimination testing failures and how it relates to participation, um, for the plans we, we surveyed, 47% had failures in the last couple of years. And, and that's a pretty substantial number. Now we're not putting a dollar number on in terms of the, the majority of how much those failures were, but any failure that is a little more administrative and basically means that somebody's not getting the full benefit that they could. And some trends we saw with these plans that were failing, that only 29% of these plans had auto enrollment that were failing, and that on average these plans were only contributing 22 cents for every dollar that a participant was contributing. And then on the flip side of that, the plans that were passing was almost double. So now that's obviously an expense of the company to, to double the employer match, and that's not what we're re recommending you do but it gives you a sense of what can happen and, and if you're putting enough money into the plan, you're often going to avoid these failures. And again, this will benefit some of your key employees that are trying to save for retirement. We also noted that for the plans with failures that 11% had enrollment of 1%, sorry, eligibility requirements of one month or less. Um, most of these plans that are failing do not have an eligibility requirement that low. So, Again, they're not encouraging participation as quickly, so the participation rates aren't getting up and the employees aren't getting the money into the plan as quickly. And again, on the flip side, 55% of the plans that are passing, their eligibility requirements were one month or less, so they're letting their employees get into the plan pretty soon after they started the company. And like we've been saying, there, there's obviously an expense to putting company money in, but that boosts employee morale. There's a tax deduction generally, depending on your tax situation, so there's, there's a lot of benefits to putting company money into the plan. Yeah, and when you're looking at some of these plans that have, you know, 
a six month or one year eligibility requirement, you're going to have employees along the way that just even forget about the plan altogether and then obviously they don't enroll. So I think it's important that you educate the employee on the day to hire as to when their eligibility is and again, the sooner that they're eligible, the higher likelihood and the quicker that they'll be enrolled into the plan. You know, as Jim mentioned, you know, the plans that pass are basically contributing twice as much to the ones that don't pass. So, you know, it's worth noting that if you want to pass a test, it's going to be a, a cost of doing business and you're going to have to either contribute more money to the plan or figure out ways to get higher enrollment. So that's when the auto enrollment feature comes back into play. But we've always run into companies where the, they're failing it and the highly compensated employers are really upset when they're getting their money back. And, you know, there's only so many ways to get around it. The, the easiest way, I think, as Jim will mention in the next slide, is to go the safe harbor route. But we'll get there. So this isn't an all-inclusive list by, by no means, but here are some methods to avoid failing your non-discrimination test. So first thing is to increase your participation, and auto-enrollment is a, is a nice way of doing that. You can also increase the employer contributions into the plan, and that'll, that'll be twofold. That'll start help balancing out these accounts, and it'll make it more attractive for, for employees to join the plan and to increase their deferrals each, each year. And, That'll also improve your employee morale and, and it'll give you a leg up on the competition. There was, there was the slide earlier that Marty was showing comparing the, the different industries, what type of match they're putting into the, to the plan. And if you're in a competitive environment and you're trying to get important employees in, in the door, this is a way to do it. Um, some, some other ways of increase, and then you need to increase the balances of the non-highly compensated employees. One way to, another way to do that is auto escalation. So what auto escalation is, is the participant can elect to have their withholding go up by a certain percentage each year and you can usually cap it out. Um, so say you join the plan and you're at 4% on January 1st, you could say, all right, every January 1st I want to go up by 1% up to a max of 10%. And usually with a lot of companies, if that's the time of year when raises are being given, the employee won't even really notice that, that fluctuation in their paycheck because they're getting a raise that's slightly offset by an additional withholding each period. The Another option is to elect to be a safe harbor plan. So generally when you're on a safe harbor plan, you get out of certain non-discrimination tests. So these failures we've been talking about, you no longer have to worry about it. However, there's a cost to doing that. So the most common way to elect that we see is a 3% non-elective contribution. And non-elective means that the, if an employee is eligible to be in the plan, then they're automatically getting that 3% non-elective contribution. They don't necessarily have to be contributing. So it's different than a matching contribution where Typically, you see the employee making a contribution and then the company making a certain percentage match of that contribution. You can also do a safe harbor match, which generally is 100% of the first 3% and then 50% of the next 2% of withholdings. Um, but like I said, we, we generally see the 3% non-elective. And when these contributions are made to the participants, they're 100% vested. So if you make this contribution to an employee and, and they leave a year from now, that they, they are allowed to take 100% of that safe harbor contribution they received. So this next slide talks about eligible compensation. And I have to say, you know, I was a little surprised by this statistic because it's been my experience that for the most plans that I audit, you know, they allow for participants to defer on, on their bonus comp. And I would have guessed this split to be more around the 80, 20, 90, 10. So I was surprised when, you know, 35% of the companies that responded said that they don't allow employees to defer on their uh, bonus compensation. On the, on the other hand, too, it, it also seems like half the plans allow for a separate election on the bonus deferrals, while others just defer on bonus like they would, you know, any other paycheck at their normal deferral percentage rate. Uh, you know, if you're unsure if your plan allows for separate elections, I recommend you check your adoption agreement because that's also been a big hiccup in audits is making sure the participants are aware of their ability to defer a separate percentage on their bonus and uh, or opt out if they don't want to defer on it all together. You know, we've, with regards to the eligible comp, we've seen a litany of issues when it comes to using correct eligible compensation for employees. You know, some of the biggest trip ups come around, you know, the bonuses, commissions over time, uh, and, and stock compensation, which typically what I see is an ex stock compensation is usually an excluded item because it's a non-cash deferred comp, but we've seen plan administrators trip up and, and include that in the comp. The DOL has really been cracking down on their audits of uh, plans to ensure that the correct eligible compensation is used. So, you know, so as a result, we've kind of made it more of a focal point when we're doing our audits. 
you know, there's usually, a, hopefully, in your case, there's a nice clear section in either the adoption agreement or the plan document that, you know, specifically states what should be included and excluded. And, you know, I implore you to talk to your TPAs or advisors to make sure it's being done correctly because it's something that you really should scrub every time you're remitting deferrals into the plan on a pay period basis and double checking that the proper accumulators or codes with whatever payroll you're using are being backed out. You know, as a matter of fact, I was actually, you know, auditing a plan a couple weeks ago and I, and I had never come across this before, but the plan had a, had a safe harbor non-elective match and it was, I think it was 3% of their compensation. But the plan document was written such that a participant was eligible to receive a non-elective contribution on the comp even before they were eligible to participate in the plan. So just to kind of give you an example of how, you know, there's so many different nuances of what is and isn't eligible, and it's really important that you know what the definition of your plan is with regards to eligible comp, because if you don't, hopefully your auditor comes in and is able to catch it and help fix it before you put the plan at any kind of, you know, risk or exposure of being in trouble with the DOL. Because, you know, for us when we're doing our audits, you know, not only are we auditing, we're obviously trying to help the client do whatever we can to keep them away from DOL jail. So this was another uh, interesting topic. So, you know, segueing into this topic was a statistic that we found worth noting. So about half the plans indicated that they have, you know, an investment advisor on the plan, while half didn't. And what we think from this data is that the half that said no are probably the ones that are working in some of the bigger shops such as Fidelity and the John Hancocks of the world that, you know, have their own in-house advisor versus the plans that, you know, hire a third-party wealth management or investment advisory firm to uh, consult on the plan. So the ones that say no, I don't truly believe they don't have anyone advising on the investments. I just believe that they did not hire a third-party person. Um, you know, what I found even more surprising was that the overwhelming majority of the plans didn't have their investment advisor named as a fiduciary on the plan. You know, as auditors looking to protect our clients, we feel it's in their best interest to have an investment advisor, you know, named as the fiduciary. You know, it gives added attachment and, and to quote a dog in the fight, as you can see the cute puppy dog on the slide, uh, to ensure that they're meeting their fiduciary responsibility. Because those who aren't named a fiduciary on the plan, there's less motivation to perform to the best of their abilities and it can put the plan at risk. You know, this has been a real hot topic with the DOL lately. As a matter of fact, I think it was last April the DOL released its final regulation as to who is defined as a fiduciary under ERISA, which was, you know, it's designed to offer protection to plan sponsors and participants with regards to advising on the funds and, and what they have in the plan. But basically, the new regs force the advisors to disclose, you know, whether they're operating in a fiduciary capacity, you know, disclose their sources of compensation and conflicts of interest. Uh, so this has been a real hot bill, but actually recently Congress delayed the bill for two years, so right now it's a hot topic and it's going to create a higher standard for all plans and investment advisors on the plans, and eventually it will become a regulation. So the plan administrators need to be aware that just because they bring an advisor into the plan as a fiduciary, it doesn't waive them of all liability. It just helps bring an added fiduciary expert for that particular part of the plan. You know, we've seen a couple of different ways the advisor can act in this role, whether it's you know, as a 321 fiduciary or a 338 fiduciary, which they're both very similar, but in one case, the advisor recommends fund changes and the investment committee accepts those, whereas on the other side, the advisor actually makes the changes and lets the committee know. You know, it's important that all investment committee minutes are kept despite whatever role the advisor has with the plan. You know, the performance of funds and fees, which again is a hot topic which we're not really getting into, but those should be monitored and documented again to avoid any exposure. A lot of participant lawsuits have come from big name companies lately over, you know, fees and the lack of fund performance and a lot of the companies that have been getting in trouble for this are the ones that don't have any record of their minutes or documentation that they're tracking the performance of the fees and the funds in the plan. So, so, so as I'm sure you noticed throughout the presentation that we didn't, we didn't drill down on every single question that was part of the survey. I think a lot of them kind of are kind of go without needing extra um, information, but we're happy to go into any of those in more depth if anybody has any questions. We have had a few questions get posted while we've been talking, but please feel free to post any others and we'll start going through those questions now. So the first question is, uh, I see a lot of responses from professional services. I work for a bank. What is the average employee contribution that you are seeing for banks? And so I personally, I, I audit a lot of um, 401k plans for banks and, and banks are, are generally very generous on the employer contribution side. Um, and, and I usually see about 
um, employer contribution to employee contribution ratio just due to the nature of the profit sharing contributions that I generally see go into those plans. Now if you're a bank and you're not doing that, I don't think that means you now need to go back to the drawing board and completely change things. Maybe there's other things that you have a leg up on the other banks. However, if you're, if you're benchmarking from a, a plan standpoint, then um, that, that is what we are seeing as the, as the standard in the banks. So it looks like the, uh, the next question we have here is, what is the most common, use, common mistake you see in the administration of plans? So I think we touched on a couple of those. As I had mentioned, some of the biggest areas of error that I run into around the auto enrollment and the timeliness of auto enrollment, uh, you know, the eligible compensation issue, we're constantly finding you know, ineligible compensation being included. And then probably one of the bigger things is just the general rules around late remittances. Um, you know, there used to be a rule that you had to remit the funds by the 15th business day of the following month. The DOL has uh, clarified that over the last few years, and it really has become the rule of thumb is it's as soon as administratively possible. So once you demonstrate that you can remit the funds in a certain period of time, you're now going to be held to that standard. And we've seen, seen a lot of plan administrators not either know or understand that rule. And oftentimes, you know, things get remitted late because they're on vacation or they're sick. So, you know, you should have a backup person remitting the funds if you're not there to do it. But that, those three things are the biggest things that we see as issues when we're auditing plans. And, and to add on to that with the late remittances, sometimes things happen. A couple of years ago up here in Massachusetts, we had a, a lot of snowstorms. So there, there was time where people just couldn't get to the office for a few days. So when you have that, it's, and there's a reason for it being late, and you can demonstrate that when you remitted it, it was as soon as administratively possible for that pay period, I recommend documenting it. The DOL generally isn't going to come in and audit you the week after something like that happens, so it might be a year or two or three years down the road that they're coming in and asking questions, and, 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 and believe it or not, you'll probably forget that three years ago that something happened that particular week. So document as much as you can, put it in the file, and then you have a kind of a like to stand on if the DOL comes in to audit your plan. Next question. So the a, a third question we have here, um, for a company that has not needed a 401k audit before, but may need one soon, what is involved with having your 401k plan audited? Um, so the, I mean, this is a common thing, and I would say the, the good news generally when your plan didn't need an audit, but now it does, is you're, you're growing. Because like we said earlier, once you're, once you're getting around that 100 participant um, headcount, that's when you need to start looking to see if you have, um, you need an audit. And generally with, with our audits is we're not auditing the investments, which is sometimes a common misconception. We're, we're auditing the compliance with the plan document. So we're making sure that if you have an eligibility requirement of 1,000 hours and six months of service, that that's what you're following, that you're not letting employees join too early or, and you're giving the opportunity to employees to join when they are eligible. We're looking to make sure that contributions being withheld from the employees' paycheck are being remitted to the trust timely and that it's the amount being remitted is what they ask to be withheld. And then we'll, that's a real focus in our standpoint. So we'll take the payroll report and make sure that all the withholdings for employees are, are agreeing to what was uh, remitted to the trust. And from the standpoint of the company being audited, I mean, nice thing these days is most things are electronic. So the, the TPA is going to handle a lot of the requests that we're having. A lot of the things that the company will need to do is is pull payroll reports, pull I-9s, and other paperwork such as that. But for the most part, a lot of our requests can be funneled through the TPA, and, and they can take care of a lot of that. Is there anything you want to add to that, Mark? No, I think you've covered everything. Are there any other questions? All right. So don't be shy if there's any other questions out there. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, well, if that's it, then we just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to sit and listen to us today. If there's anything that we didn't cover that you'd like us to cover, please you know, feel free to contact Jim or myself. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions related to your own employee benefit plan, again, please do not hesitate to ask us. Um, and uh, that's it. So have a great day. All right, take care, everybody.